football team in the SEC Conference. We're going to build the best football program in the SEC Conference. You have now arrived at Stadium in Fair. Boys and girls, ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Stadium and Gale. It's your favorite Uncle Silk. It's Dan. And Papa Delatore. Papa. I was just call you Daddy Delatore, but I thought the okay, internet Okay, Dan, might, this is a know. children's, this is a family show, please. <laughs> thought the internet might take off. Nick, congratulations, <laughs> brother. Uh, if you don't follow Nick on social media, which you should, I think about 50,000 people do. Uh, but if you don't, Nick, why don't you share the news with the uh, the podcast family? Going to be a dad. Uh, have known for a little while. Uh, we're was keeping it on the down low because we wanted to tell um, wanted to tell my parents in person. Uh, they live in South Florida, so we used the Florida-Miami baseball game, that trip down there, uh, as the opportunity to tell them. Uh, don't, uh, don't count on your boomer parents to get a vanilla ice reference. Bought my wife mm. a, a, a sweatshirt that said ice, ice with an arrow down to her belly. Um, <laughs> oh, and, layup, uh, my, man. my sister got it. My sister, uh, she's in her twenties. She got it. Uh, and then the video that I have, she, my parents are like, my sister literally says, read Lauren's sweatshirt. <laughs> and uh, my parents were like, "Ice, ice. What's ice, ice?" So luckily, we had a we had a backup plan, like a little booty thing, a little booties uh, that said, "Like, hey, bring these, hold these till September." So timing, terrible, Ti- terrible Ooh, timing, awful, awful timing. Baby is due uh, two days before Texas A and M plays mm. the fighting Billy Napiers. Uh, so sleep. Who knows what 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 is sleep? There is no. You're gonna need some joy around that time of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully I can uh, keep my sarcasm uh, to a minimum on two hours of sleep a night uh, during football season. Mm. Well, congratulations, brother. Very, very happy for you. Um, You know, I know Silk's very proud of his daughter and son, but uh, now you're having a daughter. So congratulations to you. Oh, oh, congratulations. Dan ruined ruined the gender reveal, bro. It's all about Dan. It's It's all about Dan. He had a whole gender reveal set up. and Dan just Dan's out of the running for Godfather. Just took himself right out. I'd be a bad Godfather. Oh, my God. I got... uh, I've got two little nephews, world's best uncle. Uh, they had a Hopefully little. Hopefully, you ruined their gender, gender reveals, man. Oh mm. man, that's that's my bad. Um, so, Nick, why don't you make the announcement? My apologies. Well, if you're watching on YouTube, I've got my girl dad hat on, having a uh, a little girl. Uh, not sure I know what to do uh, with a baby daughter. I think a son. We'd be wrestling. We'd be, you know, running wind sprints. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would be taking my own advice, which I told you, Silk. You know, that, listen, really encourage the left hand throwing early on. I was going to ask you about softball pitches. Do like lefties get the bread the bag too? Like you tired? I don't know. Head? I don't know. We're gonna we're about to learn though. We're about to learn. <laughs> no, I think uh, it's, it's blessings, bro. Uh, I always wanted a daughter first when I first started dating my wife, and I always told my mom I want to have a daughter first. I have cousins that uh, male cousins that have, have older sisters, and that's like the cheat code, bro. So it is, man, like you're going to get, you know, you'll have your son later. I'm going to go ahead and speak that into existence. But you want a daughter first, man. Daughters take care of you when you can't, you know, wipe your own ass and do Mm. that type of stuff. So just spoiler. And when you do have a son, she's going to be like a second mom, you know, and and Mm -hmm. nurture and teach him. If the boy's first, like he's just going to teach her how to fart and do goofy (laughs) shit, man. Like, you know, she's going to be rude. That's how my little sister was, man. She had two older brothers and she was just like a dude. So blessings, bro. Blessings to you and the old lady, man. Thank you. 
Congratulations, Nick. Sorry, I ruined that announcement. Unbelievable. Uh, so we've got uh, Mayaka Gator said, Silk Thompson, Delatory, Incoming. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Names. Like, what, what are you, you thinking names was? Not going to be Danielle. Yeah. Not going to be Danielle. Sorry, Dan. Uh, my sister's name is Danielle. Uh, don't know if we're going to do that. Um, I don't know. I like the name Sloan. Little entourage vibes. Yeah, um, Sloan? I think Lauren Sloan. Sloan. I like that name. Did you never watch Entourage? So no, I haven't. I heard there's about a it, character but... named Sloan that top notch. Dan, we're talking about my dog. <laughs> you mentioned Entourage. You mentioned Sloan. I was trying to see where this was Dan, going. Bro. Dan's out of the Godfather. <laughs> Dan's out of Uncle. Dan might get a picture on, on the third. Well, obviously, I'm not going to be the uncle. Yeah. You know, I'm not even getting a baby shower invite at this point. No. That's fine. Teach it. <laughs> I said Brooke in my stead. I've been to two baby showers, and that's two more than I've ever wanted to go to. <laughs> you got to go to um, black baby showers, man. It's like a DJ's vibes. Mm, the food's that fire. Sounds like it. <laughs> that, sound, that sounds like uh, that sounds like oh, Dan's man. baby shower. Sounds like a, a, a regular Wednesday night, so yeah, just, just a Tuesday. Um, maybe, maybe Frankie. My dad's name is Frank. I think my my wife has talked about um naming her Frankie. I don't know if that'd be like Francesca, and we call her Frankie. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you might get bullied. I don't know, it's 2024. Who knows? Frankie might be a normal girl's name now. No, I like it, man. Like, I like it. It keeps well, it like, go ahead, go ahead. Dan. I was just gonna say every week. You should bring some names to the table. We can give you an update, and you yeah. can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely want. The week I definitely want our Stadium and Gale listeners to name my first child for sure. If you donate in the super chat or donate to Patreon, <laughs> you get yeah. two votes. Yeah, for every dollar that you donate, I like that, Nick. How about Where's Alberta? Policy? You want to go with Alberta? Keep it gay. No, sure don't. Sure don't. <laughs> <laughs> Brooke, uh, think my uh, my better half, Brooke, thinks that the Gators should lean more into Alberta than Albert. She thinks Alberta uh, is a refreshing of the uh, Gator brand that they need right now. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been a, a a tough couple years for the for the Albert brand. They think so. Um, okay, just Albert, a, a time to to you know maybe Alberta will bring new hope and peace and prosperity to uh, to Gator football. I mean, I know what did Albert do? But yeah, Albert ain't do nothing. <laughs> like, I'm just telling you what she said. I'm telling you okay. what she said. I'm not, I'm not mad That's at, cool. like, you know, bringing Alberta to the forefront and get, let her get some shine, but let's not put any blame on Albert, man. He's been vibing. He don't Albert coach has... defense. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, gentlemen, uh, other than Nick's fantastic news, Nick, I know you were down in Miami. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Gators' win over Miami again uh, this season. Uh, but uh, so how was your weekend? I know you were down there too, right? Beautiful, man. I was trying to get down to catch the game. We we recorded way too late. Uh, hung down in Miami. The weather has been, I know everywhere else was kind of freezing this weekend, but South Florida was doing this South Florida thing. But I was trying to link up with Nick. We texted in the group chat a little bit. I was trying to make some plans. And I look at the tickets. It was sold out, you know, sold out affair. Uh, the resales was crazy. So me, Amon, and Zach, Zach Carter was down and we did an interview with him. We was going to pull up to the game, but the, the resale tickets was just crazy. So, no, I just had a good vibe, bro. Just hung out down in Miami. The baseball team did what they had to do. I did watch the whole series. You know, I got questions and, and takes, but I did. Ooh. I was in tune with the baseball game, bro. Let's – uh Big Cags, man. Cags is, Cags is him. We'll talk about that a little later. Cags is him. He's, Cags he's, is him. he's dominated Miami. Yeah, yeah, he was talking greasy too. He wasn't just dumb and then he was looking back at the, the the dugout. I don't know if he was talking to the first base coach or Miami's dugout, but he was talking greasy. Shout out to Cal. I don't think he was talking to the first base coach. Me neither. Me neither. <laughs> uh the group chat was uh was on fire this week between the uh the Meek Mill information, the uh, the, <laughs> the trip down to Miami. Uh I was at a lightning game Thursday. We were chatting then. Uh, yeah. Then Silk thought that I looked like Jimmy from Love Is Blind, so that was you fun. You do thought my whole family thought, like me and me and my wife was watching uh, watching like the last couple episodes last night, and I hadn't even said anything to uh, to the kids about it. So it was just me and the wife saying, "Yo, this guy looking like Dan." So well, Harlan comes out there. Harlan walks into the living room, and he was like, 
dad that's that's the dan guy you podcast with isn't it <laughs> i was like no it's not but that's what i said and then i showed him the tweet he's like oh my god he looks just like him this dude looks like dan his mannerisms is like dan he started dancing my wife was just losing her mind she's like oh my god it's dan yeah so the guy on the show was also dancing yeah yeah, yeah good he, dance uh, moves bad dance moves uh mediocre but he was he had that was a, dan it was Dan. No, come on. <laughs> Here it goes. My dance moves are incredible. No, uh, I actually have somebody that uh, used to manage on my team that's from um, that area, uh, Greensboro and uh, the Charlotte, Charlotte area. His, yeah. his best friend is his Jimmy's friend. So we heard about that he was going to be on the show about a year ago. Didn't know the results of anything, uh, but um, – Interesting show. I actually got into it a little bit this year. He, the girl that he's he can't spoil anything, but the girl that he's really? with on the TV show right now uh, did say in the pods that she looked like Megan Fox. She um, lied. I <laughs> don't know which <laughs> Megan Fox. Uh, and Jimmy told her she lied after like everything. He told her family like she does not look like. Stop telling her she looks like Megan Fox because Megan Fox is is that yeah, different? Yeah. Woman? yeah. Yeah, she's from um, the, Omaha, Nebraska. Megan Cougar is who she was. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, let's get into the show. Got a big week or uh, a big week behind us uh, and a big week looking ahead. We also are uh, bringing on uh, Trevor Sikma, who's been on the program multiple times. Good buddy of mine. I know Nick and Silky know him uh, quite well, too. He works for PFF. He's a draft analyst. So he's going to come on to talk about the Gators and the Combine, uh, talk a little bit about the future of the Gators football program as well. But before we do that. Let's give a quick shout out to our friends over at Lucy. So if you are looking for a straight to your door nicotine pouch, look no further than Lucy, which is 100% pure nicotine and tobacco free. Comes in anything from two milligrams for those that use it infrequently, all the way up to the 12 milligrams. If you really want to, you know, a kick to the face. I uh, go look at lucy.co forward slash stadium, uh, mint, apple ice, espresso, mango, cinnamon, uh, whatever you might be looking for, they likely have in terms of flavors. They also do a monthly subscription package where you can get 15% additionally off of your order and you can cancel at any time. They have pouches that you might be used to. They have the breakers that we've talked about with the little flavor uh, breaker ball in there, and they also have gum as well. So again, lucy.co forward slash stadium will get you 20% off of your order. Always comes with free shipping and a 30-day refund. So again, lucy.co forward slash stadium. The fine print Lucy products are only for adults of legal age. Every order is age verified. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Let me let you know a little secret. The uh, Espresso Lucy. Mm. Delicious. It, I'll tell you what, Nick. Does it have caffeine in it, too? Or is it just... No, no. no it's just, just flavor. It's, just flavor? It's just a nice little nicotine hit in the morning. Mm. Can you can have it with your coffee? Then you get your caffeine, same flavors, all good. I, I haven't you cracked. You any might of need this. be might need to be experienced to be drinking with it, but uh, old baseball player, no problem with that. I haven't cracked mine open yet. I've been just it's just been all my Lucy's just sitting in the box right there. I've been trying to find the right time to get into it, but uh, I, I might have to try it out. You know, I'm I'll scared you, of nicotine, you know but I might try it out. If you're listening to this. Uh, there is another company, very popular. You can find them in gas stations. I gave uh, a couple of the samples, uh, a couple of the tins that they sent me to some of the guys. Uh, and now like they it. just want me to get them more Lucy's. I said, use code stadium, save yourself some there money. You um, but you can't, get them at, you can't get them at gas stations, uh, but certainly nah. the milligrams are higher. You got to call the plug. Yeah, I tell, you, I tell you what, if you are not a nicotine pouch user and you think 12 milligrams is for child's play or a good introduction, <laughs> it'll kick you right in the teeth. Yeah, kick Blake you in the a, teeth. Blake is in the comments. Uh, he put MNGA, make nicotine great again. Make That's nicotine crazy. great again. Um, shout out to a couple people and then we will get into the show. Joey Fitzpatrick fishing. Uh, that's a very nice. Is that a barracuda or tarpon? Gang, I can't gang. tell, but what? Just say gang gang. That's all. Oh, gang gang. First time watching <laughs> Stadium and Gale live. Appreciate you watching, Joey. 
Uh, and Harrison Sanchez was wondering, is Nick pregnant? And the answer he is, is yes. Yep. Uh, it's a modern miracle of medicine. I am pregnant. Wife is super happy for me. No, well, that's the politically correct way to say is it. it? No, we're we're pregnant. Yeah, the men okay. you get to say that. Uh, do you get leave? Stadium Miguel, we don't offer those benefits. No, you got you got a podcast leave. through it. But that's oh, on three. <laughs> that's on three. Offer you maternity leave? <laughs> like how does this work? Uh, I I think I think I do get paternity leave. I don't know oh, that I get it. I don't know that I get it in the fall. <laughs> it might okay. be like a January. It might be during uh, coaching search season, transfer portal season in uh, January. That's not good. Nick, don't speak that into existence. Don't right. speak. Well, it well, it's it's uh, assistant coach. It is assistant coach. It is. It, it's- Coaching season as a whole. Correct. After a undefeated national championship season, some of the offensive coordinators uh, and other right, coaches right. might get poached. Uh, Joey right. Fitzpatrick, I, uh, it was a Barracuda yeah. caught in my favorite city, which everybody knows is Jacksonville. Yes, so sir. thanks, Joey, for joining us today. Uh, Barone71 said, Mark Light Beer Stadium was Gator country this weekend. It did seem like from all of the videos that there was a lot of Gator fans there. Uh, small stadium in. though, right, Nick? Only yeah, 3, like it's Miami, Light. It's Miami like man. You gotta keep it small. 3,500 roughly. Um, it used to be so it was. I think it was built in the seventies and like in the eighties, nineties when Miami was dominant. It was like one of the crown jewels. Like it was very, very good at that time. Um, and there's just no room to build. They can't make it bigger, better. There's no footprint. Good. They have used everything. That they can't. Alex Rodriguez gave him a bunch of money, and people are like, "What? They, what? What did they use it I for?" Like, John Ruiz did too. John Ruiz and Alex Rodriguez uh, built themselves suites that they nice. sit in for the games. That's a good uh, idea. And then no they, yep. they added like a little indoor, you know, <laughs> batting cage, pitching area, um, and a, uh, and a new weight room inside the stadium, but mainly suites. Yeah, there's just not much you can do. It is a great environment. People in South Florida love baseball. Miami has smart baseball fans. Um, they're one of the blue bloods, I think, of college baseball. Smart fans in Miami, um, no. but but they've they've been catching Kevin O'Sullivan's hands uh, for the better part of seventeen years. He Good. he shrunk that lead that they had on our baseball program pretty fucking fast, man. Excuse my language. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He um he has done that with Florida State and and. Uh, and Miami. Miami, I think if Florida, I think if Florida State swept Florida uh, for the next five straight years, they would even the series. Wow, mm. Sully's got no business, boy. Yeah, big, see a big series uh, this season against uh, FSU. I think they're one of only five teams right now that's undefeated. Uh, that obviously won't last, but um, you know, hope for some good Florida Florida State ba- uh, baseball games again. Obviously, with the Gators victorious, Harrison, uh, let us know. But Harrison's big, uh, big watcher of the uh, of the program here. Let us know that he has three kids. I didn't know that Harrison had any kids. So congratulations, Harrison, on all three. Uh, but that that's the best thing that you could tell me. You. you want that girl three first? Girls, it's easy. Three girls kids, are easy. Three kids in Vail. I can't even imagine what like lift tickets, boots. Skiing, get a big bread. Drop a super chat in Harrison. Harrison, big bread Sanchez. (laughs) Yeah, big bread, big big bread. Uh, First thing, first thing Nick thinks about is is is, is money, right? Like, bro. Well, no, no, I know. And Harrison, Harrison moved to Vail not long ago, and it's ski season right now. Like, I'm wishing we, uh, Lauren and I were planning, we're like thinking about like a ski trip, and then she found out she was pregnant, and I'm like, ah, I guess we're not skiing. I think, I think the epic, I think the epic guys. reveal passes are like a thousand dollars for the ski season. So it's five. Yeah, we, have, we, have, we have a lot of friends that live out in Denver. So it's like, we can stay with them and, and you can yeah. go right. Just like the Ajax for a day. They do that a lot. Uh, or a train, a, a something, a basin, maybe I can't remember. A basin. Called. Yeah. It's Arapaho like 35, basin. 35 minutes from, from Denver. They go and ski there all the time. We love Breckenridge, but don't think skiing is in the cards for me. Not with that attitude. So uh, the ga- <laughs> the Gators did announce that they filled out their coaching staff with uh, what we had told you guys was likely going to be a second offensive line coach. Uh, they announced the hiring of Jonathan DeCoster as the second offensive line coach. Uh, he's going to be assuming the role that Darnell Stapleton had, and he is uh, coming over from 
the Cleveland Browns. So a little bit of a backstory here, four-year starter at Louisiana pre-Billy Napier. Uh, then he spent three seasons as a graduate assistant tight end coach at LSU. He also worked at Old Dominion and was the offensive line coach at West Virginia State. He was also a graduate assistant at Nevada. Uh, so that is uh, the news. He's been an offensive analyst for the Cleveland Browns. Uh, so gentlemen, uh, talk a little bit about your thoughts. I know Zach Albaverde put a little bit of commentary behind uh, behind this hiring as well that we can go over. But what are your thoughts on the addition of Jonathan DeCoster, if you have an opinion, of course? Uh, we're still young. Uh, do like to hire some NFL experience. Um, don't mind you for just we just have we have a very young staff. Uh, yeah. But I like to hire on paper. Um, considering you know the time of the year we are hiring like right now there's not a lot of candidates that are looking to upseat themselves and you know and look for another job especially in the college world but considering all the variables around what we had to do and in and, and this right before spring camp i didn't want to go into spring with you know not enough people on staff uh, that just gives me willie taggart vibes right if we not we don't have a full staff so glad we got a full staff um the guy, I think he's going to be good on the trail. There's not a lot of evidence there as far as like prior mm -hmm. recruiting, but you know, being a young black or minority on the recruiting trail in Florida, I think that's going to pay his dividends. And, and everything's not about race, but recruiting, recruiting matters and relate relating to people matters. You lose Stapleton, um, a brother, uh, bringing in another brother to put it right beside sale. I think is a is a legitimate move. We'll see how the mm -hmm. uh, how well the offensive line uh, performs this spring and in the fall, but. Considering everything around it, you can't be mad at the hire, in my opinion. Yeah, it's really young staff in terms of, you know, power five experience. Um, I don't know. I think I'll, I'll reserve judgment. Um, I just don't know that Florida got better on the offensive line um, uh -huh. or better enough. So I think you need to coach them up. So got your work cut out for you, coach. We got yeah, two probably. OCs and we got two offensive line coaches. So, mm. progress. I, yeah, yeah, but I think we even talked about it. Like, Billy has made a, a point of it every time he's been asked that he thinks having two offensive line coaches is important. Thinks you have 15, 16, 17 offensive linemen. You should have two people coaching them. Um, he, I mean, he said it for day one. Uh, and then we've continued to ask him about it. So, I thought maybe you don't rush the hire and, and you just promote Russ Cal or um, promote uh, Ryan O'Hara, uh, which would then would allow Billy to kind of move around a little bit more uh, and not just stay with the quarterbacks as much. But I, it was always going to be an offensive line coach, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. I think it's uh, on par. Not I'm, I'm going to be short here, Dan, but I think it's on yeah. par with uh, when you bring Stapleton on too. He didn't have a, a, a boatload of experience outside of you know playing in the game but as far as the coaching experience he didn't have a ton and i think you bring in somebody that's on par with with that as far as experience wise mm -hmm. as being your second o-line coach right so obviously some concern just about the amount of time that he's spent uh, at the college level uh, i think he's had one on the field uh coaching season under his belt so definitely uh some cause for just uh, trepidation uh from my end i know that Zach Albaverde uh, gave some some additional insight into it, um, said that Billy Napier was very high on his experience uh, with the Browns and being able to learn under a, a really good offensive line in 21 and 22. He was around the LSU team when they won their national title uh, as well, is from South Florida, has some connections uh, down there. Uh, they also mentioned the name that Edwin Pata was another name uh, that was being considered from uh, for the role. Pardon me. He was previously the offensive line coach at Florida A&M. He's worked at Miami for the last four years, um, most recently as a senior offensive analyst. I know that he also uh, mentioned that there's not a lot of coaches out there that potentially want to make that move to be one of two coaches now coaching the offensive line. So if you're looking for that, that individual, um, you need somebody that understands where their role is and what their responsibilities are as well. And sometimes that can limit your pool when somebody want might 
total control. And then obviously you have to look at how does that person interact with that person? What kind of experience does that person bring to counteract uh, the other person that has that role? So having kind of a two-headed monster on the offensive line, even if it's tiered in terms of responsibility, a two-headed monster, it can be challenging uh, to fill that role. So again, we don't know. We'll see. Um, again, my biggest concern is just the amount of experience of, of on the field coaching. Uh, but again, you know, we'll see. And obviously your great coaches had to start somewhere and this could be, uh, you know, a diamond in the rough, obviously working under Bill Callahan with the, uh, with the Browns is, is something that you want uh, to see as well. Um, real quick aside, you just said something mentioning his South Florida ties, like this staff needs to get down to South Florida. Like Andy Jean mm. is Andy Jean the only co- signee they've gotten Man, from it's crazy from the, that you said Tri County in, in three years. Like first year I gave him a pass. Like, listen, they've got this. They were in Louisiana. It's a whole different level of athlete you're recruiting, but they want, I mean, they had guys, four stars, you know, asking them to do wind sprints in the backyard <laughs> year one. Hey, send us this film. So like I get it. They they want to do their their due diligence. So that first staff I gave them or the first class I gave him a pass. Like, yeah, these are guys they're familiar with, but like at some point, like, Hey buddy, you need to hit 75 South hit turnpike South. There's, gotta, there's uh, talents down in West Palm, Dade, Broward. For sure. Mm. You need the relationships uh, to, I mean, NIL is one thing, but you still, we for lost sure. some guys uh, yeah. that had some relationships that got us the Andy jeans. And, 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 and I know we got some off the field guys that we're going to talk about that exited uh, this the, the past couple of weeks, but you lose some of those guys. I'm forgetting the guy. I think Hypolite or what's his name was. Um, they end up getting us Andy Jean. Yeah. 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 yeah, correct. So you need the relationships as well to be able to uh get down there and and have a legit opportunity and, and, and a shot at landing these guys on the trail. But we're just missing some of those relationships, and you know, I don't know what the answer to that is, but yeah, to get and down we are by a show. We are a biased show, all three of us from South Florida, but like that doesn't change the fact that there's dogs down there. Skill position is what I would say. Cause I think South That's Florida is lacking sure. uh it with, with the trenches, quarterback is not really our bag, you know. We got but speed skill and space position, down, down, correct. Down, down DBs, down wide ways. receivers, a linebacker here, there, but I think skill position is our bag down here. But I like I like the way they recruit the trenches out of Georgia, Texas, like getting a little flexible. With that type of stuff, but I'm with you. Um, Zach said a little bit of the same thing this weekend when I sat down yeah. with him. Is we missing some of those South Florida dogs, and he's a boy from Tampa. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, just looking it up, Nick, and you are exactly right. Outside of Andy G and the Gators have signed one person from Fort Myers, which is not South Florida, on the other side and of the coast right. there. Uh, and then Sarasota, but everything else seems to be Tampa, Orlando, uh, and North. Uh, so four. Yeah, definitely not a lot in South Florida. It's an area where the Gators have had uh, a lot of success uh, with their players. And uh, obviously there's a lot of great talent that comes out of South Florida. Uh, it is one of the hotbeds. Broward and Miami-Dade and West Palm are amongst the hottest counties when it comes to NFL draft. Daniel, Urban, know, Urban, Urban, Urban didn't camp out down here when he won, though, to be to keep mm-hmm. it a bean. Like, his best players didn't come from South Florida. For sure. That's true. I, Nathaniel Rogers says patience and loyalty is how you went over South Florida. I think uh, relationships and bags. Bags. Relationships yeah, yeah. Bags. bags over patience South and loyalty. Florida, for South, South Florida. Florida is for sale, baby. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't think having lived and grown up in South Florida, I think the one thing that I see uh, South Florida completely lacking is, is loyalty in every stretch of every part of life <laughs> down there. Right, except for talking, family. Other than that, there is there is zero percent loyalty in the entire Tri County area. I was yeah. talking to a, a buddy who coaches high school baseball up in North Florida, and he's like, "Man, this these kids are able to transfer and and go re- whatever high school. These zones don't matter." And I was like, "Buddy, that was normal in two thousand five, six, and seven when I was in high school. We had dads who had cheap apartments in different districts, so their kid." could go to a different school and then they would get ratted on and the dad would have to go like buy furniture, rent furniture to put in the, to, to the apartments. So, like they wouldn't get caught. I was like, we've been having the transfer portal in South Florida at, at oh, a high school baseball level, not even football. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's, uh, I know we got Trevor Sikma coming on in probably 10 minutes or 
or so. Uh, Gators basketball, unfortunately, loses to South Carolina. They blew uh, a 10-point lead um, in the second half. South Carolina is obviously a good basketball program. Uh, team came out, said um, you know they're going to bounce back. They did have a win over Mizzou in a in a, in a hard-fought game that you know I think Mike White loses. Uh, but uh, you know the Gators right now sit fourth or fifth. Uh, whatever you're looking at from a, a bracketology standpoint right now, they are plus 1700 uh, to make the final four. If you believe in this team, that's a good value bet, but that's at about a five and a half percent chance of uh, making the final four uh, for the Gators there. Uh, Nick, let's talk a little bit about baseball. You were down there. Uh, Gators win two of three uh, against the Miami Hurricanes. So give us a little bit of a, a highlight reel of, uh, of that matchup. Yeah, Bass I think popping, um, man. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. yeah. There's a, a lot of uh, a lot of Gator fans down there. There always is. I mean, South Florida has a, a great alumni base, uh, Florida alumni base down there. Um, I think obviously the weekend MVP is gonna be Jack Caglione. Uh, went seven for fourteen, slugged nine twenty nine, thirty three on base percentage. Um, and, and then, Nick, if I understand that slugging percentage in nine twenty nine is a thousand is a double, right? In two thousands, a home run. Um, did I understand slugging? It, 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 there's a it's a I calculation. Like an slugging, slugging, slugging percentage is is weighting extra base hits more than singles. So it's calculating all of your extra base hits mm. versus your hits as a total. Nine gotcha. nine hundred is very very good. Yeah, of his seven Sorry, hits, ahead. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, then uh, Sunday. So last year. Um, Florida won on Friday, lost on Saturday, just like this year. And then they throw Jack on Sunday. Uh, last year, Sunday against Miami was his best start of his career. Uh, he topped that this week. Uh, he goes six innings, gave up just three hits, no runs, walked two, and struck out a career high 11. Also uh, hit a home run and went three for five on Sunday. And as Silk said, my man was talking greasy. Um, mm, big grease. We had some web gems. Ty Evans had a great play. Armando Albert, who is a South Florida kid, went up to Santa Fe. Um, he had a great play on uh, on Friday night. So I think Florida's good. When I look at Florida, um, and, and they'll they'll have D one rankings come out today, and Florida will probably stay in the top ten. I think they're they're a regional host. Um, I don't know that they're a top eight seed. You know, a super regional national seed. Um, they're really young, and we're seeing that on the pitching mound. You're going to see. Those guys struggle. Uh, Luke McNeely. A lot, a lot of batters got hit this weekend. Yeah, yeah. So on, on both sides, Florida is uh, Kevin O'Sullivan. We can't talk to him without him complaining about how many uh, hitters counts that their pitchers are getting into. Whether it's two zero, two one, three one. The home runs that Miami hit. Torres hit a home run on Friday. Two zero count or three zero count. He hit another home run on Saturday. It's a three zero count. You know what is coming on those counts. You have to throw right. fastball. You're not trying to get behind or walk. Um, and Kevin O'Sullivan is a huge preacher of first pitch strike, two out of the first three being strikes. So Florida's walking way more guys than they need to right now. That's something they need, they need to get in control. This We ended week, last season with a lot of those vibes, right? If I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, like the, 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 the yeah. game we lost – they're walk they're walking more they're they're walking guys at a much more alarming clip early on in the year than they right. than they were last year. Um I thought Cade Fisher on Friday was better, but still getting behind batters. Um Liam Peterson, who I was high on and am and, and still high on, looked a little bit like a freshman, gave up five runs in the first two innings. But for an 18, 19 year old kid, you like to see him respond. He goes uh, in the third, fourth, fifth, throws up zeros, keeps you in the game. Um, he's going to be good. It was his first real road start. Uh, he did start against UNF, but that's UNF. Um, so I, I liked what I saw from Florida. They they responded well on Sunday after a loss. This was their first time going away for a weekend. They'll have some big road series at Vanderbilt, at Arkansas, at LSU, or I think LSU actually comes here. Maybe I can't remember. Um, but they're good. They're a good young team. Um, my question again will be what happens in May? Uh, it's a really long season. And when you're relying on these freshmen, at some point they're going to hit a wall. Um, so just keeping them uh, focused, healthy, 
um, and, uh, and and getting them to the to the later part of the season. But Florida's going to be good. They're going to hit a ton of home runs and they're going to strike out a ton. And that's kind of just kind of where baseball is right now. Like feast or famine. Yeah, like like some teams play small ball. Florida uh, had a, a safety squeeze on Sunday, but like that's not what they do. They're gonna Big hit guys. the ball yeah. really far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Chicks dig the long ball, Nick. Jack uh, Caglione hit a single mm-hmm. this weekend with an exit velocity of one hundred and twenty-two miles an hour. Timothy, nah, he's just let me see. Emma, that's like John Carlos Stanton levels of exit velocity. Chicks dig the long ball, Harrison. Harrison Game no, two. That's, that's why he's got three kids, you know? Go ahead. <laughs> so 122.4 is the hardest ball hit in StatCast era in Major League history. And Jack hit one 122.0. Now, they're talking about uh, wood bats in the majors. He's got he's got an aluminum, but that, that just puts in perspective how hard the ball he hit was. Mm. Now, game two. I seen some uh did you just normally don't see, but I seen a strikeout uh for like a delay of batting or something weird like that. Yeah. I don't know if that was home cooking. Like how regular is that? And like how does that rule work? It's interesting because they implemented a pitch clock and some crews That's crazy, like, like a shot they, clock. They, I didn't like they, yeah, yeah, they have it. So like in the majors now, the batter has to be in the box, the pitcher has to be on the rubber. And the pitcher can't pitch until they make eye contact, like we're in the 1700s and we're dueling. Um, but <laughs> like you'll it. you'll see you'll see this if you watch like highlights and stuff. So the batter wasn't in the box, but the pitcher also wasn't on the rubber. Mm. So the, a box Florida rubber situation. Situation. This is getting That's crazy. Why Nick guys get out? Yeah, Never yeah. Mind. <laughs> this is a family show, fellas. It used to be. Um <laughs> Um, so Florida's argument was he wasn't in the box. The guy wasn't on the rubber. You can't call. So there, if the pitch clock violation is called on the batter, it's a strike. If the pitch clock violation, if the, if the pitcher doesn't release the pitch or start his windup before the clock runs down, it's an automatic ball. So because it was a two strike count, when the bat, when the batter was called for a pitch clock violation, that's a strike, strike three, you're out. Do they have a clock they look at, like a play clock, like other sports? Or yeah. How does this work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah there's, they got a shot clock. Uh, and I think it's 20 seconds. Mm. I need him not to get rubber clock. Out. <laughs> I like it. How does our uh, bullpen rubber. rank with, like, the rest of the conference? Like, how, like is it... I mean, it's still early. I think, I think right now the cream of the SEC is going to be – uh, Texas a and looks awesome. Uh, Arkansas looks awesome. They've got a great pitching staff. Florida's bullpen. You've got Brandon Neely, who's been a little bit shaky. He was the he's up for like the uh, was a preseason uh, reliever of the year award. Ryan Slater is kind of the guy they go to. Another junior um, in a bunch of different situations. Whether if they need four innings out of the bullpen, they'll go to him. If they need someone just to get you from the seventh inning to the ninth inning to get to your closer, they'll go to him. Um, and then they've got a bunch of freshmen like Luke McNeely is a guy they're going to go to. Uh, Riley Whitmer is a guy they're going to go to. Uh, Robert Satin's a guy they're going to go to. They're all freshmen. So they're going to take their lumps. They're all really, really talented. Um, but those are the guys that, that I, you know, I'm wondering, hey, how do they hold up over the course of the year? But I'd like to see them face some adversity early. These are guys you have to think that if you're playing baseball at the University of Florida, you haven't faced a lot of adversity. You've been dominating high school pitching. Grayson Smith, thanks, Braxton. You've been dominating. Brax. You're, you've been dominating high school. So, like, you get to this level, now you're 18, and we're still dealing with COVID. Like, we still have 24-year-olds on college rosters. Yeah. Uh, and and I don't care how good you are at 18, you're, there are some grown men with gray in yeah. their beards still playing college baseball. Yeah. Um so you're going to face some adversity. So I like you'd rather see them do that, deal with it, learn it in March, uh, than you know in the SEC tournament or the last weekend of the SEC uh, regular season. I dig it. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. We got our, our friend Trevor Sikama joining us. But before we do that, let's give a shout out to our friends over at Alumni Hall. If you are looking for anything Florida Gator related, whether it is uh, T-shirts, polos, accessories, grilling supplies, tailgate 
uh, supplies, whatever it might be for a gift, for a holiday, uh, for a uh, boss's day, whatever it might be, go to alumnihall.com or go visit them in Gainesville, right on Archer Road, right off of I-75. No better place to get everything and anything that you would want related to the Florida Gators. Let them know that Stadium and Gale sent you. But again, alumnihall.com or Alumni Hall on Archer Road in Gainesville. Joining us, big friend of the program, good buddy in real life as well, uh, the three sides minimum uh, mm -hmm. leader when it comes to eating barbecue, when it comes to anything related to the NFL draft, the NFL draft combine, our friend Trevor Sikama. Trevor, thank you for covering that great head of hair you have. <laughs> you know, you let, let the gray flourish, bro. You know, I, uh, I figured I'd wear the barbecue hat today mm -hmm. since I knew that Dan was going to introduce me like that, you know, because mm -hmm. we're such good friends, you know, we're connected. I knew that it was coming. So I decided yeah. to wear the barbecue hat today. Mm -hmm. Has fire. I like it. Well, I didn't. Well, Trevor has hair, which uh, this is a, it's a incredible show, hair. a <laughs> show that spot. could use a sponsorship from Tim's or, uh, some Lumen. sort of hair supplement. Yeah, I don't sure. Need, hey, 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 man. Like, to all the ball brothers out there, man, like, your, your life matters as well, man. You don't need it. <laughs> and all the coming, coming on board soon, too. Yeah, like, coming on. Soon, yeah. Man. I, the internet wants it two years ago, <laughs> you know? Um, Trevor, thanks so much for joining us. I, I don't know if I said this. He's a, He works for Pro Football Focus. He's worked all over the place uh, when it comes to the combine. I think he put – uh, this was his seventh combine that he's covered in Indianapolis. He did some TV hits and everything else. Mm. I mean, this guy is a rising superstar, is a superstar already, continuing to rise. Trevor, want to talk about the combine. Gators only represented by two people at the combine this year, but Ricky Pearsall seems to be uh, doing anything and everything that he can to show that he uh, belongs high up on the draft mock boards and then hopefully by a uh, an NFL team here in the next couple of weeks. But Trevor, give us your insights on the Florida Gators at the combine. There's only two so this shouldn't take very long. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I mean, Ricky is just, he, I mean, he's dominating the conversation for me because he's the guy who was on the field doing a lot of different workouts. And I mean, he just it's so impressive, man. And, and I, I tweeted this out afterwards. I don't know if there is a single prospect who helped themselves more, I, I think, since the end of draft season than Ricky Pearsall. You know, you talk about, okay, well, you take the whole year into account. Jaden Daniels is probably like a day three pick going into the year. Now he might go top three overall. So I can't say over the entire calendar, but Ricky's just had a, such, such mm -hmm. a fantastic draft season. I mean, you go into the year, he's got really good tape. I think he's improved every single year. This past year, his chemistry with Graham Mertz is fantastic. Um, I think it, when people looked at him, they said, okay, this is probably just, you know, like a, a regular old slot receiver, you know, some a mid-round pick, third, fourth round, probably early day three guy. He goes to the senior bowl, and I think a lot of people got more eyes on what is in his Gators tape. He just – kind of was able to break the narrative a little bit that he was just a slot receiver because he's different been when you see it in person. Totally. Yeah. 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 And look, it, I mean, he's not like, shoot, actually, I was going to say he's not a blazer, but the combine yeah, testing actually shock, shocked yeah. me a little bit, you know? And so I thought he was faster than he was given credit just for, but when, what deceptively you quick. Yeah. Deceptively punch pale guy. First in last out. I said uh, yeah, deceptively real quick coach. Yeah, real coach's son, you know. Every, coach is good for sure. uh, every, every every coach wants him in his locker room. There's no doubt guys, about it. I'm gonna let you guys get that off. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he is. You know, when he goes to Mobile, we don't get the slot shows... silk in the racial draft. He might be. He might be wide receiver three. He's also yeah. playing safety for us. He's well, he has to. He has to. We're starving out here. You know, we we need we need bodies. So, <laughs> look, I, uh, you see him. You see him in Mobile. He tests. He he plays very very well. I think the contested catches absolutely stood out for him. What he's able to do as a vertical receiver really stood out for him. I love the Senior Bowl in particular and the Shrine Bowl as well. They they both do a good job of this. They put these guys in situations that they're. I don't want to say like uncomfortable with, but it's it's not necessarily a streamlined strength, right? If a guy hasn't played a lot of press coverage in college, well, guess what they're going to do at the all-star event? They're going to put you in press coverage. They're going to want to see what it is. So for Ricky Pearsall, everybody's like, okay, we already know you can win from the slot. Play on the outside a little bit, and let's even send you vertical. So let's see what we got as a vertical receiver too. I think that he played really well when he was in Mobile, and then, of course, the combine whether it was the broad jump, the vertical jump, the 40-yard dash, the agility three-cone and short shuttle drills as well. Like 
This dude was elite. Like I, genuinely, he was an elite athlete. Uh, he, I think the lowest percentile score that he had for one of his tests of the combine, and this is measured against uh, all wide receivers who have kind of come through since the year is 1999. 89th percentile was the lowest. Like everything else wow. was high 80s or low 90s. There was, I think, two that were tied at 89 and then a couple of scores that were in the, the low 90s. So it just shows you, man. I mean, he's a fantastic athlete. We already know the toughs that he plays with. Um, I think that he was, like I said, going into the draft season, people were probably like, all right, yeah, like let me get Ricky Pearsall as a steal at the beginning of day three. We're talking beginning of day two now. Like I think this dude could absolutely be a top 50 pick. I've talked about him as an option at pick number 33, even for the Carolina Panthers to start the second round. I think there's a lot of teams at the beginning of the second round that would love to get him. So uh, I feel like after this combine performance, that's his range. Let's mm. uh, let's touch on uh, Ricky Pearsall's numbers real quick. Uh, 42 inch vertical leap, which was third amongst wide receivers. Uh, 10 foot nine inches in uh, the broad jump, which was eighth place in the event. He ran a 4.41. And Trevor, I know that you mentioned uh, one of the statistics there. There is something called the relative athletic score, uh, which ranks your athletic uh, skill from the uh, NFL combine out of all 3,090 wide receivers that have done it from 1987 until today, Ricky Pearsall ranked 70th. So when it comes to just being a combine warrior and just really showing who he is, uh, Ricky Pearsall really showed out in the combine. Um, Kingsley Aguakin was the other guy uh, for the Gators there. How did Kingsley perform? So Kingsley, I don't believe worked out. Um, I don't think so either. Yeah, I got to check to see if he did anything no, on here. About it. Yeah, um, I but think I mean, he was just there maybe doing interviews. Yeah, probably. I didn't. I didn't necessarily hear anything from him at combine, but he is somebody who participated in the Senior Bowl as well. You know, they're looking for some versatility for him because I feel like he could have benefited because uh, he had another year of eligibility. I think. He, I think, and so I feel like he could have benefited from coming back to school. Um, when he was at the senior bowl, it was, it was an up and down week for him. I mean, he, he struggled a little bit when, when he was there and that's not to say that that just is a kiss of death to an NFL career. It absolutely isn't, but I think it pretty much solidifies that he's going to be a mid to late day three pick. Um, didn't really hear anything at the combine to kind of change that. He really needs to kind of just master every position along the offensive line to make this kiss scenario, be one of those swing players where you can play on the right or the left side. You can play interior but you could also play on the outside like his his best uh path for the nfl is just i just think master a lot of that versatility and try to get that path so yeah i, I think i'm on record saying i i don't know that he needed to come back to florida but he needed to come back to college um listen you make the best decision for you and your family um so he he decided to declare but i i don't know that i would play him at tackle i think you can his best case is like, Hey, I can play both guards and I can snap the ball for you. Right. And maybe that's, you know, uh, when you're getting down to 51, 52 and 53, that person that can play special teams or has some position versatility uh, and saves your roster spot. That's how you end up making a roster. Yeah, no, I, I and I agree with you. He's, 32 and a half inch arms. Obviously you're not going to play him a tackle long-term, um, but he is, he's, he's somebody who, He's probably going to get a spot as an interior versatile player. But again, like Dirk Cutter, he was a former head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He would say this all the time. Like if you don't have a starting position, uh, you basically need to play all five spots for us to keep you on the active game day roster. Like we have to be able to at least have some faith in you that you're not just going to get worked at one of those other spots. And so, yeah, of course, like the reserve guys, you carry some reserve guards, just carry some reserve tackles, all that kinds of stuff. But the guys who climb the depth chart, that next man in line kind of a thing, um, it's just kind of how you, you're able to stick on the NFL. So uh, I agree, likely not a tackle, but as much versatility as you could show, that's got to be his main goal at this point. I got a question about Ricky. Like, Ricky had a very good season. I think he displayed great route running, uh, toughness, ability to catch the ball, great hands, uh, goes to the, the senior bowl, uh, cooks up the competition, leaves early because he's just cooking everybody, had a great combine. First question is, does he even, like, like if he does do a pro day, like, what does he participate in? And what from his game, in your opinion, that he's lacking? I wouldn't do a pro day if I was him. I mean, there's just, there's not really a reason for it. I mean, I'd stay in, you know, 
relative st- good shape just because you want to. And obviously you're going to shake a lot of hands with some guys at the combine. So like you want to look good, you want to stay, stay in shape, but he performs so well, maybe the shuttle drills, but again, like he, just cause they're not, I don't know. They're not as stressful on the body when it comes to training, but he already showed these fantastic there. So honestly, if I, if I'm Ricky, I could stand on basically every single number that I have the combine. So uh, I don't really see a need for him to work out too much. And then, I just think that again, kind of what we what we were saying about the Senior Bowl. The thing that I liked that I saw there in Mobile is they used him more as a vertical guy, and not just in the middle of the scene, like as an outside guy too. So it's not something that I don't think that he can do. I just would love to see more of that outside receiver vertical threat profile because very clearly from his combine numbers, the dude can do it. I mean, he's got the athleticism to do it. We know he can get off press coverage. We know that he's got a variety of different really great releases. That's how he's such a great two-way go player when he gets that space in the slot. He's already mastered that part of it. Just how much of a complete receiver can you be at the next level? He's got great contested catches as well, even outside of the crazy one-handed catch, which I asked him about when he was at his podium. And I was like, what was life like after after you made that one-handed catch? And he was just like, he was like, it was a lot different. <laughs> like, it, was just, it was a lot different after that. And, you know, he just talked about uh, how crazy it was with everything blowing up. But whether it's one-handed catches, two-handed catches, he's a tough dude at the catch point. So when you look at his size, he's about a buck 90. He's about six foot one. You don't normally put receivers like that on the outside consistently, but the ones that do, you do because you have a feeling that when you do throw up those 50-50 balls near the sideline, they're going to compete for it. He does. So that, to me, to answer your question, is is all I would really like to see more from him. It's just uh, more of those reps vertically, and I'd love for a team to give him the opportunity to do it because I think he could play it really, really well. That's ultimately why I think he is a top 50 player in this class. It's, it's yeah, kind of hard. Go you got to ask our producers, but it was like, Three weeks ago, four maybe a month ago, I was like, I think I have I peg Ricky as a low four four guy, um, and then he jumped first. And when I saw forty two, and I saw the broad jump because that stuff just shows explosion. And right. I mean, if you have a dunks, good vert man. and a good yeah, if you have a good vert, well, first off, white men can jump forty two. I, I, I had dog. never seen I had never seen that dunk video before this. Yeah, game. I knew that I, you can see explosion from stuff like that. So yep. I had him pegged at a four four as well, like mid four yeah. four to low low four four, just from like seeing him explode and do three sixty mm-hmm. dunks and a lot of stuff he was doing in the off season and he in these social media clicks. He's explosive, bro. Dude, I when I saw that dunk my jaw was on the floor. Like he made that shit look easy, easy. For easy. For sure. So I gotta get, gotta get him up to Jacksonville. No ARs. Up no, there. no. ARs, ARs up there. <laughs> he's got a bad wing. Dan, please. Um, <laughs> ARs got a, a wing on the men, but give me a little dunk contest. Or <laughs> Gator dunk contest with Ricky and AR. Every, you know, every NFL, every single NFL team that saw that dunking video is like, Hey, I know it's going to be really tempting. No basketball. Yeah, no, <laughs> like, yeah, like, chill out, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no more of that. We're not going to get that in the contract. Let's just slide that fine print in there. Yeah, that was that was like, uh, I think it was. I think it was AR's dunk who, like I saw him dunking like a pickup game or something. And he dunks it pretty hard and his body kind of comes in sideways and he lands just like hard underneath the basket. Yeah. And I'm like, I guarantee he got a text from, the from Jim Ursay himself, where it was just like, <laughs> All right, we're done with that, we're not yeah, picking yeah. up a basketball ever again. Yeah. There's videos of AR in slides doing backflips on like cement after a football game, and it's just like, yeah. Hey man, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> dude. We that got was, it. That's that's we always the it. part. Like, when, when I'm watching the combine, they make a big deal out of this because everybody goes crazy for it and they'll show it on the broadcast and everything. But like Romo Dunze, Romo Dunze after the wide receiver drills, whatever, he's doing he's doing a backflip in the end zone. And if I'm every NFL team, I'm contacting NFL Network and I'm like, stop showing this stuff on TV. Yep. We we like these this needs to, you just ran a four three nine at two hundred fifteen yeah. pounds. Like we're locking you in as yeah. a top ten pick. Don't do a backflip in the end yeah. zone. We don't need to see. It's like the it's like the uh, the Clemson running down the hill thing, which I think is just absolutely wild that they still do. How are we doing? <laughs> How are we doing this? I don't understand. I got a question for all you guys. Like, when what, what in the hell was Herm Edwards doing with Jaden Daniels, Brother. Ricky Pearsall, and Johnny Wilson? Was he, he like fired. drunk at the he wheel? Fired. That's what he was crazy. Doing. He had all that talent. He, he 
like Nick said, he was getting fired, man. I mean, that's it's that's crazy. That's cra- now. I mean, look, Jaden Daniels wasn't who he was back then. You know, he's very, very young. You could tell that he was at the beginning stages of his growth. So it's hard to, you know, totally hold that against him. But still, like you got to be able to keep your talented guys. Like even, even if, even if the version of Jaden Daniels that Arizona State got was just that first year of LSU Jaden Daniels, like that would have been worth it. You, you right. absolutely keep that college football player. Ricky right. has been fantastic. I, Johnny Wilson too. I mean, people don't, people are, I don't think people are talking about it enough. Johnny Wilson's combine day because his numbers relative to the rest of the guys in the class aren't like, Oh, top five broad jump, top five forty, whatever. I mean, he ran what a four, five, three at six foot six. It's 237 a show, pounds. Trevor. Would is, you say? It's a gator show. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Sorry, I stunk sorry. it up, man. All right. I'll keep it down. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it down. <laughs> no, but it is. It's fine. Yeah. To your question, like, I, I don't know what Arizona State was doing. Even if you just looked at Johnny Wilson, you'd be yeah. like, all right, well, I'm not letting this guy get out of the building. But For sure. they did. Now, he performed well at the combine, considering his size. Uh, he has hands issues, in my opinion. But overall, like. Herm Edwards was drunk at the wheel for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, Trevor, anybody on the Gators, and I know it's early. We are prognosticating into the 2025 draft. Uh, anybody that you're looking at uh, at the Florida Gators, I mean, I know, you know, Jason Marshall is a guy that was a potential first-round draft pick before this season started. Obviously, Graham Mertz uh, is going to be 24 years old and, and maybe not the prototypical NFL quarterback. Uh, Montrell Johnson at running back. Uh, who do you see – uh, as some potential people, maybe Jake Slaughter, people to look out for for the Gators next year. Yeah, I mean, the the, the first three names that you named would have been the ones that, that I'm paying the most attention to. I mean, I like Montreal, man. I think that he runs really, really hard. And now I don't think that that's going to become anything more than like a priority day three pick just because mm-hmm. there's so many different running backs. But like still, I mean, he's, he's, he's strong as hell. And he's going to be somebody who I think a lot of teams could convince themselves. All right, we're going to have this guy as an RB three to start, you know, maybe he'll work his way into a committee, you know, maybe he'll be our power back in short yardage situations. And I think he showcased that both Louisiana and Florida. So he's one of the strongest dudes um, that I remember even scouting for this past class when it came to the mm. running back class. And I think that's still going to exist next year. Jason Marshall, man, I know a lot of people, uh, it's had an him, interesting case. Yeah, I know a lot of people had him as a potential first round pick. I remember watching him over the summer and I was like, okay, I see why people like him. Obviously, the size speed combination, that's what you're looking for, that that athletic potential. But he still, I mean, he just he had a long way to go before he was really a, a shutdown corner. And there were times when it felt like he just wasn't anticipating the route well enough. You know, he wasn't like he was giving too much space on wide receivers. And it's just it's those little nuances of the game where you go, man, you're so big and tall and fast. I figured that you would be a little bit more of a risk taker. You would be able to anticipate these routes a little bit better and just be really, really sticky in coverage. But we didn't see him take that next step last year. I'm hoping we see it from him this year. But that was kind of I feel like if if he would have declared. I think that because this is such a loaded cornerback class, he probably would have been a day three pick as well. I know he would not be satisfied with that given how talented he is. So it makes sense that he comes back and and you're obviously hoping for a bounce back year from him. Mertz is somebody who I wasn't really taking seriously at all whatsoever before this past year, when it comes to the NFL draft, um, I thought that his, Tape at Wisconsin was fine, but mostly like very conservative. And it's just like, man, you, you just don't draft a lot of quarterbacks that uh, that high who kind of had that play style. And for Napier, he showed a lot more of a aggression to his game. Like he was very much going for those big throws. He wasn't shying away from those big moments, whether it was on first down to set the tone, whether it was on third down to pick up a, a key first down. Like Merch was very, very confident last year in Napier's offense. And you love to see it. And I think that he – really really helped himself out it makes sense that he came back i think he absolutely should have come back but you're in a situation this year where yeah okay sure he's a little bit older but Mm -hmm. i don't really care for quarterbacks and i don't think the nfl really is Mm. going to either these quarterbacks can play until they're mid to late 30s now at this point so Mm -hmm. if you're in your mid-20s and you're coming out of college but you're a really polished confident product nfl is going to draft you like it so we'll see I, i think that uh He's turned into a really good player, and I'm just I'm excited to see what he's able to cook up this year in another year of this offense. I think he'll have a really really good year. I I go I keep going back to 
transfer portal quarterbacks in second years of systems. Uh, and obviously you've got like the Burroughs and the Kyler Murray's and, and even Baker Mayfield. Um, and, and I think he will have a better year. I think Ford is more talented uh, on defense. I just don't know who he has on offense really. Um, but outside, I, I, outside of Eugene Wilson, basically. Outside, yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, I, I keep making the comparison back to 2020. Like when Kyle Pitts went down, Kadarius Tony was much easier to stop uh, when you could focus on him and not have mm-hmm. to worry about Kyle Pitts. And I think Ricky and Trey played off of each other last year. And it's like, Hey, if you're going to double team Ricky, well, uh, Graham Mertz will just pad those uh, completion stats with that little shovel pass, which counts as a forward pass. Uh, and let Trey, <laughs> let Trey go running with it. I, I really like Graham. I think he's a really, really tough player. He quickly became a leader. I, I think he would be like a day three pick for me, though. I don't know that you're using a second or third round uh, pick on him. But the NFL has two types of teams, teams with franchise quarterbacks, Correct. And teams looking for one. Correct. Uh, and, and and that's it. So you might get a team that uh, he says, listen, shoot, we'll keep drafting quarterbacks until we find one. Yep. I agree. I agree. I think that, um, I mean, we even saw that with, with, with Trask, right? I mean, Trask, I, I didn't think, was going to be getting drafted as highly as he did, but the NFL was like, Hey, we got to take a chance on this guy. He, he's big. He was productive. And I think that that could be the case with Mertz. I think if Mertz has another really great year on the offensive side of the ball, especially if, like you said, it's kind of without some of the weapons that he had the previous year, he's going to get even more credit in that offense. And I think then two years in a row, teams love to be able to say, okay, multi years of good production. Mm-hmm. Like even if it's only two mm-hmm. years, they love to just say, right. okay, he had multiple years of really good production, especially in the sec. And um, even so, because here's the thing about Mertz, even if Mertz has the same year that he had last year, it will mean more because it's yes. two years in a row and because right. of who is on the offense. So it, he doesn't have to have a burrow type year to start really, being an interesting name within these NFL draft conversations, especially when you look at the schedule that they'll, that they'll be playing. Well, can we talk yes. about your? Yes. Can we talk about your Tampa Bay hostage holders? What what are they doing? <laughs> who to our guy? Who, you, uh, who who your your Tampa Bay hostage holders? Put Kyle Trask in some bunker. They're gonna, <laughs> Baker, they're, gonna, they're gonna pay Baker Mayfield like he's Patrick Mahomes. Kyle Trask has been in bubble wrap. Can we blow the dust off of Kyle Trask and give him a chance? <laughs> he had the chance last year. He's what not do you mean? A chance. There was, there was a, he was in a quarterback. Nothing. He was a quarterback battle last year. Look, I, I look, don't know, Trevor. You, what you think it was? You think it was rigged? You guys think it was, think it was rigged? Yeah, disgusting it behavior by Tampa. It was racist, it's, Trevor. It was it, racist. It is a, uh, yeah, well, yeah somehow, a pain, somehow, it's a pain I agree. On our fair I don't know city, if I'm allowed Trevor. to agree, but yeah, somehow I agree. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we gotta get Kyle team. out of Tampa. It's just gross negligence by the entire organization. Man, he got the best job in the world, bro. Like just sit and be a backup and co- that's true. collect them in shit, Tampa man. Bay too, of all places. Yeah, it's yeah, true. He's robbing, man. Man, it's dude, nice out there. Ryan Griffin made a real nice life for himself as QB2 slash QB3 in Tampa for like eight years. Never saw the field. Never. I think he took like a handful of regular season snaps. Cashed no in, ca- yeah. cashed him, cashed in some couple of yearly checks of over a million dollars. My guy's clearing Ooh. seven figures. Chase, He's living. Chase Daniel has a Super Bowl ring and no arthritis and Come on, tens of life. millions of dollars. Right. And now he's and now he's on NFL Network. Like now Trump's he's hanging just, out. Now he's yeah. Now he's just now he's just giving takes for fun because he. Yeah, he's I mean, there's bored. probably nobody that's watched more film than Chase Daniel. You know what I mean? Chase Daniel's True. like, what are you guys? Yeah, he doesn't have about? to do Football's anything so but safe. watch film. <laughs> no. Fup- Football's such a safe sport. And like, yeah, Chase, I bet it is. You got a, Look, you got a, a splinter on your finger from holding a clipboard. The it's show Blue Mountain injury. State taught us that the best yes. job in the world is, in fact, the backup quarterback. For sure. It's actually fired head football coach at the Division One level. But second Especially at the is University of Florida. Backup. Yeah, yeah. No, they pay well to fire you at Florida. Yeah, overpay, <laughs> over buyout. Uh, Trevor, we're going to get you out of here, brother. Um, oh, by the way, if anybody doesn't know and follows Trevor, um, Trevor's a big barbecue fan. Um, mm-hmm. three sides minimum, Trevor. Let everybody know uh, what three sides minimum means and why, because I think it's a really good reason. It's not just to gorge yourself with food, but there's a reason why. Give yeah, you're correct. It, it's not a it, it's not a gluttonous proposition. Okay, the reason why we do three sides minimum is because if you go to a barbecue place, first and foremost, 
a lot of barbecue places are like homegrown recipes, right? It's like, okay, I got this from my grandpa. He gave it to my dad. He gave it to my mom, whatever. And we've been, we've been, we had this recipe for years. It's one of the best in the city, one of the best in the area, whatever it is. So you got these family homegrown recipes that you want to try. Well, when you go to barbecue places and you get a plate, what is it? Okay. It comes one meat and two sides. All right. Everybody has their two sides that they go to. If I asked all you guys, all right, what are your two favorite barbecue sides? You all say, you all would say something. And there's mm -hmm. a good chance that every single barbecue place has that. So you're already mm -hmm. locking down those two sides. You're never giving yourself the freedom to see another side. There might be, there might be a great homegrown recipe where you go, damn, that cornbread actually looks really good. Mm -hmm. Or, whoa, mm -hmm. I normally don't get beans, but those beans look really, really good. Like whatever it is. So it gives you the freedom to when you walk up to a barbecue place and you see something that might be really special at just that place. They might have a recipe that is all their own. You can still get your two sides that you love, but then it also allows you to try some family homegrown Southern recipes in the form of a third side. So that's why we do three sides right. minimum because barbecue is a unique cuisine uh, that is very, very special when it comes to those homegrown recipes. And I want other people to experience that every time they go eat barbecue. Man, that's I how I found you. fried I okra. Scripted. Uh, there we go. Three sides, there that's, we go. How I, that's how I found okra was a, a three sides minimum. Look at you. Look I at prefer you. my okras and, and, and black eyed peas, but I'm rocking with you. And, and, and as far as the two the, the sides, I do not trust people that get double fries the size. <laughs> nah, I can't do that. Can't be doing can't look, you can't be doing that. There's 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 too many places in the world where you can also order fries. If you want right. to order fries as one side, it's fine. Yeah, I'm not cool. gonna that's again, that's the spirit of the rule. You get one. Try something else. Yeah. Try one of the other recipes. Don't get try the slaw, man. The slaw may be all right. Thank you. If you're not from <laughs> the south, and if you're not from the south, and you are, you find yourself in the south, banana pudding is always an option. And that's a dessert, if you haven't man. had man. a good that's a dessert. No, that's on the side. You can just throw some banana pudding on your on your on your plate. Where was the place you went on somewhere? On the dinner in, uh, plate? That's that's just plopping right. it on there. <laughs> just oh, it comes in. It comes in. So wafers, man. <laughs> Listen, vegan silk. We're not asking your barbecue opinions anyway. Man, if you put banana pudding beside banana the collard greens, I am judging. Cup on the I'm tray. Sorry. What kind of heathen are you? I can just see it now. Nick just. <laughs> It's like the lady from Billy Madison with sloppy Joe's and makes yeah. just banana pudding <laughs> sloppy for his plate. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! All right, Trevor, we're gonna get you out of here. Um, I think you're getting married pretty soon, aren't you, brother? Um, your guess is good as mine. Okay, no, okay, all right. No, we're, we're, no, we're, <laughs> we're taking our time, brother. We're making sure whatever we do. Trevor we do it is the, uh, is the number engagement one ring like, It is. Yes. So men wear engagement rings now, okay? Dude, well, I, I, well the I whole thing, the whole thing was... I just get used to it because I'd never worn a ring before. So, yeah, okay. so uh, my fiance, my fiance, like sort of joking, mostly jokingly, we, before we were engaged, she's like, why do I got to get wear a ring and tell everybody I'm <laughs> off the market and you just walking around, you know, free. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and, you know, we had a good time about it. And so then, uh, yeah, when we got engaged, she gave me this. Especially as a man rocket, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, you got to do it. Trevor, let everybody know where they can follow you uh, online. Incredible content, incredible memes. Uh, he goes viral once a week or so. So, Trevor, let everybody know where they can follow you. I appreciate it, man. Uh, at Tampa Bay Trey on, uh, on Instagram, on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. And then uh, all the great draft work from uh, the people that are putting it together over at PFF.com. Hmm. I love it, Trevor. Thank you so much, my friend. We will talk with you soon and have a great rest of your day, my friend. Appreciate it, fellas. Anytime. Thanks, Trev. My guy. Well, our guy. All right, guys, let's uh, get one quick ad read. Then we want to talk a couple quick comments and we'll get out of here. Our friends over at Home Field Apparel, go visit homefieldapparel.com. Use promo code Stadium and Gale on one word at checkout. We'll get you 15% off of your order. They have some bundles. They have probably 20, 25 different shirts, uh, baseball, track, football, traditional retro Florida Gators logos. Uh, go visit homefieldapparel.com. Promo code Stadium and Gale at checkout will get you 15% off of your order. Gentlemen, I want to ask you about Steve Spurrier's comments and what you think about them or Ooh. if it uh, – is something that uh, Gator fans should be concerned about. Uh, Steve Spurrier was quoted in an article uh, where he interviewed with uh, Gene Frenette, who I believe is uh, from a, is a Jacksonville writer. He said, there's a feeling around the Gators of 
what the heck are we doing? There's a lot of questions that I don't have answers to about the organization. Just because you hire the most people doesn't mean you're going to win all these extra people. I question how much that really helps. Billy Napier is a good guy who works his tail off. I like Billy, good family man, but do wish the organization was a little more tidy. Yuck. Um, does that need to be said? No. Does Steve Spurrier get to say whatever he wants? Absolutely. Is it brutal for the man who has to drive by a bronze statue of Steve Spurrier in a building that Spurrier has an office and coach his football team on a field named after said coach? Yeah, brutal. Um, mm. Did not Billy Billy Napier and the Florida Gator football program did not need uh, that to be printed, uh, but. Listen, yes, sir. listen, the head ball time. coach, the head ball coach, that is the first son of Florida Gators football. Mm -hmm. Heisman winner, coach to Heisman, won the first national championship. Um, Steve Spurg gets to say whatever he wants. Um, and if you don't like it, then win football games because he will talk trash for you if you're mm. winning football games. Yeah, we've seen Steve. I've seen him frown up. I remember the Miami game when Dan Mullen was – the offense wasn't clicking, and Felipe was 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 doing his Felipe thing, and Steve did that 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 frown in the booth, that's like mm. famous, and that Jeff went. But I, I, I like when Steve Spurrier chimes in on the program. I just wish it was like a little bit more in depth of like the entire program. Um, mm -hmm. We keep making these hires and fires. Um, like why are we not hiring, firing, and, and doing things in capacity to be successful? But, yeah, I'm with it, man. Steve is one of those guys that helped set the standard at the University of Florida, and he should be able to, you know, get his opinion out about where, where the standard is as of now. But I think it's more in-depth than just, you know, what's going on with Billy. But he hit the nail on the head. We all are like, like, what? where are we at right now? It seems mm -hmm. like we're in a flux and we're in no man's land in a lot of different areas. Coaches, like, there's no stability with retaining people, mm -hmm. continuity. So there's a lot to be desired right now. Yeah. We'll it, um, we, yeah, we talked about it a few weeks ago. I think my biggest concern is just if, if you're going to sell yourself as an organizational magnate and that's what you're going to focus on, um, yeah. there does seem to be a lot of organizational and operational deficiencies. Um, the staff is probably double the size of Dan Mullen's staff. Uh, it's probably – quintuple the size of what Steve Spurrier had. And obviously I know college football has changed and everything else. Uh, but I think the organizational comment to me is uh, one that really stuck out there, but, um, it's fair. but go ahead, Nick. Um, yeah, I think, I think that it's, it's just a tough comment. Um, yeah. Not it's not, it, man. This is, this not is wrong. Big, this is big. Yeah, this is big boy. Not wrong. This, this, this is big boy football. This is the sec. This is university of Florida. That's fair criticism. Like we got a lot of yep. people running around for a lot of unorganization. Like things don't seem organized, and you brought all these people in to be, you know, super efficient and and organized, and it's just not happening on a lot of different fronts. So, I think it's fair. I don't think anything was harsh. I mm -hmm. think there's a deeper conversation about the the entirety of you know, like we holding Billy accountable. Let's hold some other people around the organization accountable as well. Billy mm -hmm. ain't hire himself, so. I think there's right. a deeper conversation that they can ask Steve and we can get some more perspective on his overall opinion of the entire situation. We should try to get him on the show. Um, one I'll final him, comment. I'll, I'll, I'll call him. See what, he, All right. see what he's got going. Cool. Um, you guys have any thoughts on what Trevor Etienne said? Uh, he was Ooh, interviewing. Good. With, uh, bad, bad week on the internet. Bad week bad on the couple internet. Bad couple Bad Man, couple of days there. Trevor, Trevor um, can kick rocks barefoot on a dirt road, man. Like we don't care. You're he, he called himself RB. That is a lover's blind quote, Silk. I'm I'm glad that you are fully entrenched in love hey, is blind. Hey man, I'm living this loving blind. I'm not a reality TV guy, but it's it's it's, it's crack a lacking. I like it. Uh toxicity at an all-time high. You gotta love it. You know, seeing people tell them tell strangers they love each other after one invisible night of not seeing each other in just a conversation. I think it's dope, but uh, Trevor Etienne, I just think it's time to move on, bro. He called yeah. himself RB2. I think he's super replaceable with what he brought to the table. Why I love his talent while he was here, 
But man, it's like you're replaceable, my guy. It's not that deep. Go be RB three, four at Georgia, and we'll see how it all works out. But I like the freshman that we brought in. I like Trey Young mm-hmm. Webb. I like Montrell Johnson. Running backs is one of the most replaceable positions in college fall. And I think we'll yeah. be more than fine. Yeah, and, and Cam Carroll in there too, should he recover fully healthy. Right. Uh, so if you guys didn't hear, then we can kind of end on this. Uh, Trevor Etienne was on a uh, Georgia podcast, I believe. I think it's, I think it's Real- other football players too. It's like that. Oh, okay. I think the it's, other called guys Re- it's called Real Talk. I'm not Yeah, I think the, the two guys that were on either side of him uh, – are on the roster as well. Gotcha. Okay. So he said, for me, does the good outweigh the bad? I've been with Florida for two years. I went through the whole process of rebuilding. Of course, Florida was rebuilding when he committed. Uh, It's still kind of rebuilding. I feel like there was a lot of uncertainty. So like a lot of questions were unanswered. There's a lot of unknown going on. I felt like I can stay here and do what I've been doing for another year or two, a better myself and take a chance somewhere else. To sum it up, I can be running back two on a losing team or go somewhere. I wanted to play in December too. That's a big part of me transferring. So I said I can stay running back two on a losing team or go somewhere and possibly be running back number one and win a natty. That's that KD culture, baby. That's the KD culture. So um, He's not wrong, though. Like Georgia's roster is way better than Florida's. Georgia will compete. For an it's SEC championship soft. in 2024, still, they will. Right, they can soft. compete for a championship in 2024. Florida will not. It's that. It's a KD culture. Ran mm. away from OKC to go win in Golden State. Ran away mm. from Golden State and then ran to Brooklyn and they thought they had this whole new thing. It's just like, listen, you can stay and rebuild and be loyal, or you can you can run away and championship chase when when things get hard. Where to the place you committed? <laughs> I'm nothing still, against I'm- him. I think he would have been Florida's best running back on the roster. But like you said, so running back is a very easily replaceable. And I said before that um, I think the perception of him leaving and where he went is worse than what you're losing in terms of production. But there's also yeah. no way he's RB1 on Georgia. Oh, I just see no, no but well. he, but he was, he's, I can be RB2 at Georgia and win a championship, or I can be RB2 at Florida and maybe. Go six and six again or seven. If he don't learn how to pass block, I don't think he's going to be RB2 at Georgia, right? And then you're just, you know, a role player on a national championship team that nobody remembers, right? Hunters get the Um, same ring that the quarterback does. I think there's like, I'm still old school into the fact that like, there's still got to be some loyalty, right? I I, I rocks with Trevor. I've done content with him. I've, you know, we've chatted personally on some stuff. Like he's a dope kid, but I'm still from old school loyalty like his options when he was deciding on the school wasn't vast he didn't have a lot of options georgia wasn't knocking at your door you know you came in as a true freshman everybody don't play true freshman running backs like billy played you right away game one versus utah and you got busy um i just think there's a level of loyalty he could have went anywhere in the country and i feel the same way about richie leonard right you could go a lot of places but you chose to go to rivals that we play against and it's up. And I think our roster should feel that way. You know, Shamar James should have ETN's number in his locker. You know, we play George rain, lose, rain, sleet, or snow. He should want to put his face mask in his chest. That's wonder, what it I is. If that's Same thing with Richie Leonard, bro. Like, when he come pulling around, we know his weaknesses. Somebody should want to drill him. Like, Cam Jackson, my guys in his in the trenches should want to lay him out. You went to the ops. You could transfer. I get today's culture and what it is now. But when you decide to go to our, our number one, and one A, one B rivals, it's up. You know, you, you, think, no you, think, you think that's the not not that we're all gonna be aging ourselves here, Silk, but like that would have been the mentality, you know, when we were 18, 19, 20, 21. Do you think that is the mentality now? I don't or see... is it like, yo, I'll dap you up before the game, during the game, after the game. Yeah, that's I no, I th- think competitors compete, right? And mm-hmm. and if you got on other teams' jersey, even though we're friends, like I like I've competed against my own brother, cousins, all of that. When you put on a uniform, bro, like you get hit like everybody else, and we'll be friends after the game. Like LeBron is still out the out the blood, like KD is still out the blood when it's competition time. We could and on dap- Twitter after games. Yeah, you could <laughs> dap it up after the game, but yeah, I expect competitors to compete. And if we got guys on this roster that are friendly with guys that got Georgia uniforms on while the game's being played, then we got the, the coaches off. Like, it should just be absolute hate. You know, Georgia, like, 
Brain Cox was here, it was absolute hate for him. Every time they suited mm -hmm. up against him. And that's what it should be. It's still a competition. It's still a gladiator sport. You know, you got to want to lay people out. And I expect Shamar James to come with that type of heat for my man Trevor Etienne. It is what it is. But somebody got to put their helmet in his chest. He got to feel the pain, even if they win the game. Make him feel some pain. I love that. Love it. Nick, you have song of the week, buddy. I uh, want to appreciate everybody for rocking with us. Thursday, today. we live, baby. We got to talk about a Thursday spring game, spring practice. We start Thursday. We know? start Thursday, yeah. So we will uh, we'll talk and dive a little bit more into that today. Uh, or uh, next week, pardon me. I uh, appreciate everybody for watching. Uh, before you leave, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, share it, uh, follow us on all social media accounts. Really appreciate everybody that joined in the discussion today. Again, lucy.co forward slash stadium, alumnihall.com, and home field apparel. Nick, what do you got for us? I got this one. Um, I think he is a Christian singer, songwriter, rapper. Kind of. uh, the song Correct. is called Good Day by Forrest Frank. Oh, I thought it was the Yay Church album. No, 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 yay. No, yay. Good day Even by though Silk, Silk's been on that Meek Mill album, I bet he has. No, I, no, I, 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 I absolutely haven't. The only thing Meek the, Mill's not been on. Listen to the backside of the Meek Mill album. I whoa, whoa, whoa. A, whoa, whoa. That's crazy <laughs> to put me like this. That's that's wild. I don't have a rebuttal yeah. for that. I wasn't prepared for that, that that line, but I thought Meat Meal had a full project. It was an EP of like five songs that it was mm. okay. I didn't even Too like busy. it, man. Yeah, it was, oh, no. man. yeah. <laughs> I got so many jokes that I'm not just not gonna do because this is a family show still, guys. Like, bro, I literally just made song of the week a Christian rapper, and then we went and then I I steered us down this road. I apologize. And yeah. I called Forrest you Frank, great voice, great song, good day. Silk, make sure you listen. Do your homework. I appreciate. I know you're that, not my listening brother, to my to my, my Irish brother jigs. in Christ. <laughs> my <laughs> brother, thank you, my brother in Christ. Killed still me. the funniest tweet. Or still the funniest text message ever me. in my life. All right, guys. Same corner, same time next week. Appreciate you guys for watching and listening.